to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch buck? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So today on the podcast, I have back on my buddy, Dan Bacar. So Dan Bacar, he works over at the Eastman's office, and Dan and I are just cut from the same cloth. Like, Dan loves to bow hunt like I do. And every time we get together, it's like a 24-hour podcast all about in-depth bow hunting. Um, so on today's podcast... We just sat down, and, and I didn't have much of a plan for the podcast. I just knew that we'd get into some good bow hunting content. And so it made for a real authentic conversation, and then we just do a deep dive into archery and into stalking and execution, hunting different terrains, situations we're looking for, uh, high percentage stocks, low percentage stocks, like so much gold in this podcast. So uh, I always really enjoy talking with Dan and just glad that I could capture it for today's podcast, and I think you guys will enjoy it too. I want to thank my sponsor for today's show, Sitka. So Sitka builds the best technical mountaineering gear on the planet. Uh, I'm so impressed how over the years they just evo evolved their, their function and their fit. They've evolved their fabrics to come up with the, the best layering system for any hunt out west. And so they have a different system, you know, for hot weather, early season, for early season antelope, early season mule deer. Uh, that lightweight hoodie is such a breathable, nice hoodie, but you can also cover up from the sun so you don't get sunburnt or sunburnt the, the back of your neck or your ears. Um, they, they have a, a lightweight pant, so uh, the, the, the best pant for that early season. I like the Apex. That works good. Um, they also have the scent pant, which is a great lightweight, breathable pant, but they have these systems all the way through all the way to late season where you can really layer up and, and be comfortable in, in, in any weather that comes your way. And, and so it just keeps me out there longer. It keeps me safe. I rely upon it. I'm super impressed with their new Kelvin light gear they came up. So that's their insulated jacket and then their insulated pants, these three-quarter cut pants. Uh, they have the, the warmth to weight ratio of, of goose down, but they also have like a, a, a water-resistant covering over them where it doesn't get the insulation wet on the inside. It's just an amazing product that... Their jacket, the Kelvin Light jacket, is my by far my absolute favorite jacket and insulating layer. And all the way through, they have shells, uh, the, the heavyweight hoodie or Apex hoodie is great. They just have so much great gear. And it's about really building a system for all these different seasons. And so, you know, you don't have to go out and buy everything that Sitka makes, but it's just like update or upgrade you know, a piece of gear a year or a couple pieces of gear a year, and it just makes for a great backpack, well, uh, backpack hunting, you know, uh, day hunting, whatever the case is, but it just builds a great system for these different seasons, and it really makes me more effective in the backcountry, and, and not only that, but that subalpine pattern with those browns and greens blends into almost any environment I've ever hunted, from Hawaii to spring bear to my fall hunts for high country mule deer or for elk. It's just this this great camo pattern where if you hold still, you're just dang near invisible. And so I'm so impressed by that. I'm so impressed by the technical mountaineering gear and impressed by the company of Sitka and really happy to, to have them on board on the podcast. So if you're in the market for any new gear, make sure to check out Sitka. They're just producing great gear. I actually wear... I wear that sick of gear, um, you know, I shouldn't wear it to, to work, but it's just the best gear that I have where I use it in my layering system for working outside in the cold. I use it when I'm fishing. It's just the best gear that I own and builds these great systems. And I actually, I have this buddy, Charlie, that I fish with. And, um, you know, Charlie's kind of getting into hunting and he owns this sick of gear and he pushes the sick of gear to all the fishermen, how it's better than the, than the, the, the fishing, um, like the, the waterproof shell jackets that you can get. He's always showing it off, but it is, I, I, I truly love it. 
and use it uh, 365 for all my outdoor adventures. It's it's just great gear. So make sure to check them out. Um, thanks to Dan for laying down this podcast. Dan also um, uh, operates the Beyond the Grid, the internet hunting TV show. So you can search Eastman's Hunting TV on YouTube. You can find it there. Uh, I've had a few episodes come out, and they keep dropping more of my episodes that came out on the Outdoor Channel. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, we had that new one, Open Country Bucks. I was proud of the way that came out. And I've got a couple more episodes that I'm really excited to see loosed and, and uh, have you guys check those out as well. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, make sure to, to check out our magazines, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Eastman's Hunting Journal. Uh, check out our, our internet research tool, Tag Hub. They're constantly e- improving and evolving this program. Uh, it's great. I've been using it a ton this season to figure out which tags I'm applying for, uh, odds, uh, success odds. Um, uh, there's just there's so much information and data in there. And uh, they're constantly improving that program and improving the, the, the membership. And they're doing some giveaways and things. So uh, make sure to check it out. It really helps in my Western research. And with that, let's get into this podcast. So all about bow hunting uh, with my bow hunting brother, Dan Picard. I uh, really like this guy, and uh, this is a great podcast. Uh, I enjoyed it, and I hope you guys enjoy it too. So let's, let's get the show started here. Oh, this chair is wonky. Oh, that's how you lower it, huh? Yeah, there's like three different levers I on know here. it. And like the recline on this, that's that right there. <laughs> Don't get bucked out. Yeah, I know, right? It's like <laughs> wants to throw me forward too. There, it should be good. Okay, I'm live here. I'm at the Eastman's office. I got my buddy Dan Picar just stepped in the office, and we thought we'd sit down and record a podcast. Thanks for being on, Dan. Yeah, it's always fun to be on. Yeah, for sure. Um, thinking about bow hunting, I bet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Trying to plan next trips and thinking about how COVID's going to affect everything and you know what to do this year oh i know it. it it's so fun playing with the possibilities it's one of the funnest things about application season and tag season it's just playing with all these hunt opportunities and, and then i like to dream on some of these bigger hunts that i may draw a sheep tag or i may draw a moose tag or whatever the case but it's so fun to play around with it odds statistics looking into a map yep absolutely it's funny too so i was just thinking about this the other day Like you think about like, oh, maybe this is my year. I'm going to draw a sheep tag or a moose tag, but you don't want to think about it too much because you don't want to jinx yourself in the draws. (laughs) And it's it's funny because I've drawn some tags in the past where I've been like, nah, I I won't draw or I totally forget about it. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones I've drawn. Mm -hmm. So it's like a mental game too. It's funny. I like always go back and forth with it. You're superstitious like a baseball player. Totally. And if you find success doing everything one way, whether that's putting your right sock on first or your sweatshirt, or like you, forgetting about your tags seems to be your secret to drawing them. Yep. But it's funny how the human psyche, how you want to redo that uh, any way to get that good tag. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a mental thing, and bow hunting is too. Oh, and it is. I, I found this a lot too, and I'm, I'm completely superstitious. But I'm convinced – the the less hard I try the more successful I am but it's it's not just black and white like okay I'm not gonna put effort out but it's maybe it's more of just believing in your process and believing in your routine and if that means that you're up there on a vantage point and you can take a two-hour nap and you still believe that your process and your program is going to work maybe because it's proven itself in the past to you in your mind that that's what you rely on And you're like, oh, no, I'm going to be fine. I'll I'll have something. I'll have my opportunity. And it's almost like a superstition. Do you find yourself that way too? Like, of course you do. We're bow hunters. (laughs) Yeah, there's things like that that stick out to you, right? I mean. Exactly. Yeah, I was trying to put my finger on it as you were talking about it. But there is definitely something to wanting it too bad or you know, trying too hard, but it isn't trying too hard because you want to put maximum effort in and you want to continue to believe that you're going to be successful, but, but you're, you're, you're onto something there, Dan, because it is like 
the more you just let the hunt go and believe in the process, like you said, and believe that you're going to get your opportunity if you keep working hard, it comes together. And I find that with buddies, too, is we'll find a decent four-point or a decent six-point bull, and I'll just think, no, I'll give you the chance. I'll get my chance later. Don't don't worry about it. You take this stock. Heck, take the first couple stocks. You know, we got days. We'll find some more bucks. And it that's what fills tags is like um, yep. you you almost – it's, it's weird because we care so much, but you almost have to let it go and, and just like almost surrender yourself to the hunt and keep putting forth maximum effort, believing you're going to be successful, but not like over trying or trying too hard or like like really overthinking something or spinning it around or or getting caught up in one of the details or a bad stock. You just got to let it yep. go and keep hunting. You're on to something. Yeah, and you just believe like what happens is going to happen and it's it's out of your control. It really is. Mm -hmm. But if you put yourself in the positions that you need to be in, maybe when it comes to like, you know, your hunt specifically, you're going to be fine. And that's what you tell yourself. You're like, no, you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And especially like, like you bring up a good point, like hunting with a buddy. And I've seen it a lot in like camps and like some guys that maybe they don't get a hunt a lot and they're like, oh, I want first shot. Or like they get too wound up. They try too hard. They want something too bad. And then the end of the hunt comes around. Maybe they didn't get that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I think there's something it like superstitious, something mental about that, where you want it too much. You're trying too hard. And you brought up a good point too, overthinking. I see that all the time. And hunting, it, it's funny. Me and my brother were joking about that this fall. He's more of the, like an engineering type mindset. Mm-hmm. And he considers me or my family considers me more happy go lucky. Mm-hmm. And my brother's like, well, I overthink things way too much. And he's like, that's my Achilles heel. He knows it. Mm -hmm. And he'll sit there and contemplate on a stock. And then in his head, he goes and blows it. Mm -hmm. And he he jokes. He's like, well, all the animals, they always commit suicide in front of you. (laughs) And it's like, I just, I don't know, man. I just don't think about it. I just, you're there and you know the routine and it's, it comes down to repetition. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think ultimately he's like, well, you do this all the time. He's like, I haven't killed an elk with my bow in like seven years. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, if you're doing anything in repetition, it's going to become second nature. It's muscle memory. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so we are just having fun with that, but yeah, overthinking it is, is huge. Oh, you can second guess yourself. You can second guess where you're hiking and hunting that day, but instead you just have to surrender and hunt where you're at. Like if you pick a drainage to hunt and you hike in there, You can't be hiking in there thinking, guy, I haven't heard anything bugle this morning. I'm not going to find anything. Man, I really should have chose two drainages over. Instead, I've already walked in here in the morning. I've got to commit to this drainage and hunt it wholeheartedly. And it's amazing how many times you go in there and think, well, maybe it won't be that good, but I'm going to hunt it anyways. And then you turn up a bull or you turn up a buck. And then the whole game changes. Yep. So I think you're right. And I also think decisions in the hunting world are not black and white. They're gray. And so these, these gray decisions, th- there's, there's really no right or wrong of when you're going to stalk this buck, whether he's in his bed, whether he's on his feet, whether he goes in the thick cover, whatever happens, you just kind of have to adapt to it, make a decision, but you can't just rethink that decision. Am I right? Am I wrong? What would this guy do? What would he, you just like almost rely upon those instincts and start acting upon them and believe in your decisions. And then it's amazing what yep. comes together. And I think that comes from experience, yeah. right? By just doing it a lot. And uh, I, I see I, from other guys and talking to other guys, you bring up such a good point with, you know, they get into a drainage and maybe there's no bulls bugling or they're not glassing up the bucks that they think they should be. And so then, you know, the, the wheels start turning in the mind and like, oh, maybe I need to move. Maybe I need to go somewhere else. Maybe I should, you know, hop over this way. But ultimately it comes down to, well, I'm here. Let's hunt it and let's spend a day in here or spend at least an evening and a morning in here and see what's in here. And then, yeah, you never know what's going to happen. And if they're not there, at least I cross that off my list yep. because I gave it a good morning hunt. I didn't half-ass it in the morning and then leave to another drainage and don't even really know what's in there. And yep. so like giving it my all or living in the moment seems to really help me. And then where I also find that wanting it too bad comes down to making shots. And so it's a fine line between, you know, seeing your window to kill that bull 
and not forcing a shot. And it seems like if I just if I just relax and I, I make the moves that I think I need to make, but I don't force a shot and I don't force a bad angle, I don't force a shot in between limbs, like I know what I'm looking for as far as a shot on a bull elk to kill him. And I, and I won't sacrifice on that. I'm not going to shoot a bad angle. I'm not going to shoot a bad shot. Where in the olden days, I may have wanted it too bad and I try to force it in between limbs and that arrow shanks off a limb and flies off. I miss the bull in the scenarios over or you know you 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 think this is your shot and you maybe shoot an extended range shot end up spooking the bull and you never get a chance where if I just would have continued to play the game with them and wait for the shot that I'm looking for and been patient that bull dies but that it only comes with experience yep it really does and that's huge what what you just described right there I think can kind of sum up how to be a successful bow hunter Everything else, yeah, you can do your homework on and, you know, your optics and how to glass and where to glass. But when it comes down to the moment of truth, that right there is what matters. That right there is what is the difference between going home empty or going home with, you know, a pit in your stomach because you made a bad shot on a buck or a bull and going home with your tag punched and a clean kill. Mm -hmm. it, and, yeah, you're, you're spot on. And it's... It's like waiting for that right shot, and then when I do have the shot or I have the chance to execute, when I first started bow hunting, it was like that that adrenaline is running so off the charts, charts that I, I, I just find that pin on the animal and instantly buck that shot off. The difference between making a bad shot and a good shot is less than a second for me. It's settling my pin and letting that thing aim in the middle and kind of calm down a little bit. And then I execute, you know, pull on my trigger, execute the shot. Where I make a bad shot is where my pin finds the middle of the body and I snap my shot off. That's where bad things happen to me. But if I just take that extra second on my shot and let that pin settle in that body, it's like they die every time. But that's so tough to remember and keep in the forefront of my mind for every shot I take. And I almost have to think about my shot. I've been working on my visualizations a lot lately where I close my eyes and then I've got a string that's to my draw length that I'll hook up to my release and close my eyes and kind of picture that bull walking out or where he's at and waiting and then I picture drawing back and then maybe he's down a hill and then just picture my pin just settling in the middle and executing and and I I think that helps. I think the the visualization and then when I'm on a hunt not just getting lost in the hunt, remembering that I still have to make a shot to close the deal. That seems to really yep. help me. Yep. What, what helps you with your shot sequence? No, I mean, you, you described it great right there. And over the last several years, that's what I concentrate on during the moment of truth at full draw is if I just aim for another second, maybe two seconds, depending on the bull or buck's nature if, if you you know if he's on alert if he's not just take that extra time to aim it's amazing the difference that that makes into making a clean kill mm -hmm. and so when i'm at full draw like you said it can be hard to remember that but that's what i focus on mm -hmm. and that's what helps me send a, a great arrow and the difference between you know a disaster and a clean kill is aiming that extra second and that's a long time an mm -hmm. extra second and when you're at full draw on that pin, that means for me, what it means is you come to full draw and you're not shooting when your pin goes across his chest the first time. You're, you're, you're waiting. I want the pin to, like you said, hover around that and be in that zone a few times, a, f a few of, you know, it w it, which could be a second. Not the first time, never nope. the first time. Never the first time. Never the first Spot time. On. And that's what aiming is, is waiting, never the first time and waiting. And, oh, my gosh, a world of difference for me specifically. Me and, yeah, and with the way you're describing it, I mean, it, it's the exact same. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly what I found. Mm -hmm. It, it's yeah. so funny. Me and Dan are dancing around this office with our arms at full draw and talking to each other. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's so great to get you in here. I just love talking bow hunting with you. It's it's just so wild, like all the similarities that we have in executing a shot. And um, you know, I've I've totally gotten rid of any target panic I had. Like I don't I don't even see much of it anymore. But I do notice when I draw back on animals, you know, I have to tell myself in my brain, okay, put the pin on them. 
Like my pin, I draw back and almost my pin's way off the body or something, you know, or like like way low usually or way over. And I say, okay, put the pin where you want it. And it it isn't, like you say, it isn't snap shooting as soon as the pin gets on them. It's put the pin on them and I put the pin. And at first it's kind of erratic and then it slows down and my aiming gets smaller and smaller. And then I start pulling on the shot and then I can execute a good one. Yep. And, and so with target panic right there, you're accepting – the motion, mm-hmm. right? You're accepting that hover. It's not going to be bench rest solid. Nope. Right. And I've, I've never, I don't know if I've ever struggled with target panic. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of guys do. And when I, you know, I look at what is target panic and thinking about it and it's like, well, I've never like really developed a complex over like the hover, or not having bench rest, you know, being solid with that shot and then rushing it. Mm-hmm. And so I think everybody experiences a little bit differently, but I don't think I've ever encountered target panic. No, you haven't. I think you're clean from it. I mean, you may see some, some, um, like, um, some of the, the small effects or something, but yeah, you aim really good. You put your pin right on the middle of the animals. When I had it, um, it was like my pin would settle low. My pin would settle at six o'clock, whether that was on a target, whether it was on an animal, and it was rock solid, but it was low. And I'd have to try to fight that shot or fight that pin up and then execute my shot. Um, so I just, it just, um, your brain just starts anticipating the shot and it mm-hmm. won't allow your pin to sit where you want to aim anymore because it's used to your brain saying now now shoot now shoot and then your brain starts to anticipate it so it doesn't want to let that pin get to the middle anymore and so you really fight your aiming or it settles low like like that's what it is but see if you execute a good trigger pull like a trigger release is the most accurate best hunting release but you have to be good on your trigger pull it's the same thing with the trigger pull like when you learn how to shoot a rifle they tell you to squeeze the trigger It's the same thing with that bow. And so you learn the right way to settle your pin, be okay with it moving around as you're squeezing on the trigger and as that shot breaks. And so you just haven't developed that, that anticipation of the shot, which is awesome. It's better to never, never get it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. And and that's what I've heard too. And I, I just remembered, remember when we talked to Levi Morgan, maybe a couple years ago. That was a great podcast. Yeah, it was great. And, and that really helped me too, because you know, talking to him, I always want to improve. And I was like, Levi, what can I do to improve my shot? And that was one of aiming drills. And mm-hmm. that was one of them. And that's what it, I've really focused on that going back to the moment of truth is just, you know, you know practice aiming, but just aim, mm-hmm. just aim and be, be comfortable, be okay with that hover, mm-hmm. be, be okay. okay with it. Yeah. Be okay with it. It's out of your control. You're not going to have, you know, a bench rest, solid, you know, lead sled type rest, like a rifle, you know, mm-hmm. during a bow hunt. And maybe that's what really prohibits target panic too, is rifle guys that are used to that, you know, rifle setting or that bench rest solid. And then they, they go to archery and it's a, it's a mental thing of transitioning to being okay with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you seen that in, in guys maybe that, that hunt rifle and bow that suffer from target panic? Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think that definitely could have something to do with it where they want it to, you know, they want the pin to be in the middle when they shoot. And, and so where I think people start developing problems is with that movement is trying to time it when it goes through the bullseye. So your pin's moving around and all of a sudden it goes through the bullseye and you go now, and you do that 50 or a hundred times over or a thousand times over. And pretty soon your brain starts to know that, Hey, we're getting close to the bullseye. He's going to go again. And you, you get what's the funky chicken where you're, where you're, yep. where you're full draw and you, your draw lets down because you're anticipating the shot a little bit. Or the pin just never wants to go in that middle. It's like allergic to the middle, like a magnet. It just will not aim in the middle because your brain's anticipating that shot. And so, yeah, you have to be okay with the movement and, and you have to let that pin aim. It's the best thing you can do yep. to to, um, to to not ever get target panic. But yeah, the trigger releases are, are just super accurate, the easiest ones to use, and they shoot great. It's just as long as you don't develop those problems. So it's practicing the right way yep yep practicing the right way and and it the aiming drills going back to that and what levi said anybody that's listening to this i mean it, it can't hurt go practice aiming drills yeah to, to our viewers so yeah guys go go practice aiming so what that means is you know whether you're in your garage or your backyard you draw your bow um you know with an arrow ideally i mm-hmm. mean i guess you could 
draw it without an arrow, but you don't want to drive draw by mine. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the idea is, is just to draw back anchor and just aim. Mm -hmm. You're not shooting an arrow. You're not releasing anything. You're just aiming and then let your bow down and just practice that. And it just trains your brain to be okay with that movement. You're so right. Yeah. And it's so funny if you're dealing with target panic and you do that aiming drill, the minute you stick your finger behind that trigger and decide you're not going to shoot, that pin aims right in the middle. Yes. Yeah. But if you're going to shoot, all of a sudden now it's lower. It's allergic to the bullseye because it's anticipating that shot. So you're right. Those aiming drills are key. The other thing that I, you know, and, and a lot of this stuff I know, but I find myself like reverting back to it, go like finding the um, finding the benefits of doing it, like the aiming drills and like blank bailing. Blank bailing is so important to my shooting, but I kind of get away from it because I aim so good that I just end up going out and shooting targets. So I've been working on my blank bailing lately, and blank bailing. It is not aiming at all. It's just letting the pin float down there in the middle of the target, wherever it is, and executing a shot and trying to feel the execution of that shot and what a good shot feels like without uh, without the where the arrow's hitting or the arrow hitting in the middle determining what a good shot is. You're determining a good shot by what it feels like and the execution of it. And you get to learn your release really well. You know, and, and releases, you know, like... Um, you know, even shooting a thumb, shooting a trigger, whatever it is, you get to know this release and and you almost like preload the release a little mm -hmm. bit, a little pressure on the thumb before you start to pull, depending on how much tension is there, you know? And so you get to really learn your release and your form all through that, that blank bailing. And so, you know, these drills, I know all these things, but I, I need to practice them year in, year out because they do make me a better shooter. Yep, absolutely. And that, that brings up a good point too, that what resonates with me is, you know, just because you've done aiming drills and you do them all the time, or you maybe you did them in the past, and, you know, you think you're a great bow hunter, you're a great shot, you've had a lot of good kills in a row, doesn't mean you shouldn't go back to those. Mm -hmm. Don't get complacent and, and think that you have it figured out. Mm -hmm. Always go back to those. I don't think you can – maybe you can work on muscle memory too much if, if you're, like, overdoing it, if you're over trying. But those muscle memory drills are just those, you know, really specific drills, like, you know, like the blank bailing or aiming drills – always go back to them. Mm -hmm. It won't fail you. It's, it's only going to keep you sharp. Mm -hmm. and, and even shooting, like winter months get tough for me because, you know, it, it's dark when I leave my house and dark when I get home. And I like to shoot a lot. And so even just pulling a target in my garage and shooting 10 mm -hmm. yards. Uh, the other thing that helps, I love shooting indoor and shooting Vegas rounds. Like it's wild. You know, I'm not a Vegas shooter. I'm not, I'm not uh, shooting tournaments or anything, but I can shoot that, that hunting bow really well. Well, you start to you start to kind of know what scores you can shoot and you start almost putting pressure on yourself to shoot better scores or to shoot better numbers. And so it's this really fun game, but it's amazing what pressure, like I, I pride myself at being clutch in those, those intense moments, but it's funny how I'll be playing this Vegas game. It doesn't matter. I'm not turning it into anybody. Even the whole line I'm shooting with, nobody's watching me or paying attention to what I'm doing. They're just paying attention to their own bow. But all of a sudden, you know, I'll be shooting a 300 game in that last set the pressure is on and I'll drop a nine and I didn't shoot a nine for 30 arrows. And now all of a sudden I shot my worst arrow under pressure. And so like, that's the goal. Like I want to put myself in those high pressure situations because that feels like shooting at a deer and elk. And I've always yep. said, like when you're practicing, when you go down to look at your group, your worst arrow in the group is probably going to be the arrow you shoot at the bull. Like uh, that's going to be, you know, so you want your, your worst arrow to still be in the group and still be in the kill shot. You want good consistency, but it's amazing how that, how that pressure, it really plays on. So I think it's good to shoot like with buddies, around buddies, yep. even to mix in some of the, the ski shoots or the 3D shoots. Even if you're not trying to shoot a score, or win a tournament or whatever it is, it's high pressure shooting, yes. which is good for a guy. Absolutely. Everybody needs it. I mean, if you want to be a consistent killer, you have to have mm -hmm. you have to have that pressure situation repetition. And that that gets me thinking too about pressure situations. Do you do you find yourself maybe in one type of hunting scenario that you feel the pressure more than another type? Uh, for example, for, for like me, 
when if if I'm stocking something, if I'm if I have a lot of different things going on, I'm I'm keeping tabs of the animal I'm stocking, but I also have to be just mouse quiet with my feet. So I have all these little tiny details that I, I have to really pay attention to. I find myself it's a little more pressure on yourself. You start shaking a little bit more, other than or and compared to um, rather compared to a situation where maybe you're in an ambush setup. And you're just sitting there and, you know, the, the movements, the animal and like situations like that, I don't, you don't feel the pressure. Oh, wild. So you feel the pressure more when you're stalking and making plays and more things to think about Yes. where if the animal's walking at you, you just relax and wait for your opportunity. I relax. I I know that I'm in the spot that I need to be because I probably set up with a shooting lane that you're trying to anticipate or whatever. And you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's all on him now. And, you know, when you're stalking something, it's on you. Mm -hmm. You're the one that has to make that final movement, that final last movement that determined your fate on that stock Mm -hmm. compared to a situation where you're, you have the upper hand, you might be sitting there or you might just got lucky and you got in front of a herd of elk or whatever, and they just feed by you. And it's just like, zinc and yeah, no pressure. Do you find yourself in situations like that? Maybe you shake less or you're like less nervous in that, those types? That's really interesting. Like as I think about it, you know, I think I get nervous if I don't have anything to think about. Almost when my mind's occupied and I am stalking, like I just don't have time to get excited where if yep. I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for him to walk in, I'm almost like building it up or like I'm and, – and I really try to focus on my breathing if I'm getting too excited, like big deep breath in, big deep breath out because that adrenaline – like, it's real. Like, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to make a shot. You know, it, it's pulsing through my veins so much. But I do know what you're saying on the stock. So I do start to get nervous because, like, like we can all go walk and go be quiet out here in the gravel when it doesn't matter. out. But it, it's like every step counts when you're making that stock. And so all of a sudden, yeah, those nerves – they almost mess with your agility and mess with your ability to, to really control yourself in every move. Now, I pride myself on these moments and being good in these moments, and I, I, I want to thrive in them. And anytime I see an opportunity, I want it. But I do notice at the beginning of the season, I'm really nervous stalking. And it almost takes me getting into range of a few animals or just bow hunting for a little bit, like antelope's a great warm-up, where I just start to get more comfortable with it, and then it's just normal. Then I'm just stalking normal. I'm not overthinking it. I don't have this uh, like flood of adrenaline that comes over me where I can't even step without my legs shaking anymore. Or yep. I'm not losing my balance just standing there. Ba- you know, so like I definitely get better at it throughout the season. But yeah, I would say for me, like I don't know that I'm any less nervous when they're moving into me. But I do notice that on a stock that those nerves can get me making those moves. Oh yeah, they just yeah. get you a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I and that's stuff I try to pay attention to because when I'm out there, I don't want any surprises. Like, you know, when you start first start bow hunting or maybe, uh, I don't know, when you're younger, you, some of like how your body reacts or how your emotions react to a situation might surprise you. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want any surprises Mm -hmm. on my hunts. You know, there's a lot riding on a filmed hunt. I mean, Mm -hmm. and so you don't want any surprises on how your body's going to react or how your nerves are going to react to a a Mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why too, I just love that. That's what what we do. We hunt all the time. The more you hunt, the better, the more situations that you put yourself in to experience those emotions and those nerves, the better, Mm -hmm. because then you can map out who you are and how, how you react to every situation possible. And they are different. Every situation is a little bit different, but for an idea, I think it's very important to know how you react to multiple situations so you can number one maybe improve on it or you know positive Mm self-talk no negative self-talk in a situation or you know knowing that you're going to make that shot and you know taking a deep breath all these little things help Mm -hmm. and so if i'm if i'm making that stock and i know i I might struggle with this or i know i'm going to have more nerves when i'm sneaking through there and maybe there's like a lot of gravel and i don't have my my boots are on and so i know i'm just kind of you know on the line i'm flirting with it with blowing it 
and you're like, oh, I got to be careful. So it's like maybe taking some extra time and taking a deep breath. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden your knee starts, <laughs> you know, straightening up a little bit. Your knees aren't knocking together mm-hmm. a little bit. Take a deep breath yeah. and, and really take your time. There's no rush. Mm-hmm. And so those little things that you do what you can do to calm yourself down in the situations that you know you might struggle with. Mm-hmm. That's what's really helped me. I think you're right. Yeah. And, and also, you know, there's a time to move and a time to close that deal and that killer instinct. You kind of know it, but the, like, like time is on your side on those stocks. Like the slower, the better, like to take a knee mid stock and go, okay, God, I got to catch, catch my breath here. I got to I got to get control of myself. You know, uh, I, I do think that's a good move. And, and I think, um, you know, uh, you're bound to miss bow hunting. And I think when, when a miss does happen, um, you know, I think you got to look, you got to look at it and see what went wrong, but don't dwell on it or don't, don't focus on that bad focus on the next opportunity. You can't ever have those shots back. And so it's just like, I just got to be better on the next one. I, I got to make sure my pin finds that animal and I got to just aim a little bit longer. And I know that pin will get them, but I, I can't focus on the negative. I've got to focus on the next shot and the positive yep. and want that next encounter. And, and really to tell you the truth, I mean, that's when I'm at my most dangerous is after I miss on a hunt because I'm just possessed to try to get another opportunity because I want to wash that L away. I want that loss to be off my record. Nope. I, I know I can do it and I know I can close a deal and I messed up or, you know, the, the, and there's so many variables. I mean, we talk about executing shots. Sometimes that's the least of your worries. Sometimes you did settle your pin. You did execute a good shot, but you know, like, uh, uh, the, the deer, like I, the last deer I missed was, um, I, I snuck in and he was bedded with his does in the perfect spot. And I slipped into these trees and, and then he stood up right as I kind of got into range and he's on the backside of the hill and he's cruising and I can see his horns, but I can't expose myself cause the does are there. And I kind of moved back around, but everything is happening so quick. And this buck's leaving the does. And as he's moving, I finally get up over the ridge where the does can't see me and he's walking and I'm able to hit him with my range finder and I've got 44, you know, and I'm kind of moving with him on the ridge and I get 44 and he's going to come into the last opening I have to shoot him before he disappears and walks away from me. So I had a range at 44, but there's a few steps in there where the deer was walking and I was walking and then he's kind of come out in the open and I have to draw back and then grunt at him to stop him and then execute my shot and then executed one right over his back. Uh, like I think he'd, you know, he'd walked into 40 or 41 yards by the time he got up there and moved. And so there's just so many variables that go into it that executing a shot, you know, that may be the biggest thing, but, but really like getting a true range on an animal, like making sure I have a good range on an animal, um, you know, the, the getting into bow range on these hunts, you think if I could just get into bow range of this bull, I could kill him. But getting into bow range is only half the battle. Getting the shot is the other half of the battle. They're always moving and they're always behind the cows or they're always like, it's just never perfect where he's standing there broadside. It's always like you're moving with them and you're, you're trying to make something happen. So there's just so many variables that go into actually making a good shot on an animal and it's paying attention to all those details and it's coming by you at a hundred miles an hour too. Absolutely. It's so difficult. And I, the biggest takeaway from, from listening to you right now is you have to be okay with missing Mm -hmm. and you have to accept that that is part of bow hunting Mm -hmm. and everybody misses. If you, if you don't miss, you haven't hunted long enough Mm -hmm. because you will miss It, it. I was really able to connect with you on, uh, the last beyond the grid. Mm -hmm. Uh, your mule deer hunt Mm -hmm. and you you crept over that rim rock and that buck was right there and you are literally i've been in the situation you're you're scrambling you have to draw back because that buck is at 15 yards below you and you know you don't have time you have to execute a shot as fast as possible that buck just starts to move and you send it right over over the top been there Mm -hmm. been there but that's such a tough situation and your, your kind of response to that and how you handled it is like, you know, you, you kicked in the nuts, but 
that's bow hunting. Mm -hmm. And you just have to, you kind of have to laugh it off. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> that son of a gun. He got the best of me on that one. I, I kind of, I like to laugh those situations off because you just, you have to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And that's why we bow hunt. Cause it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And the kills or the successes are that much more gratifying mm -hmm. uh, because it, it comes with work and you, you need some luck too. Mm -hmm. But that, that's where it, it's big. And you, you said it well in the video too. I, we left that kind of segment in there where you're kind of talking about it mm -hmm. a fair amount. And, you know, normally we, we may not, we might want to move on with the show and keep it flowing quicker, but that's a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Like listen to your commentary about that. And, you know, you're, you find yourself in a situation that you didn't plan on. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I found, found myself doing the same thing too. And it was probably even a worse situation than what yours was. And I made a, a dumb mistake, but I'm stalking in on this antelope and the wind switched and I was at full draw and the buck, it was just within seconds. And I, I was taking that extra second to aim and he took off and I shot. And by the time the arrow was, I mean, he wasn't even close. It was, I was stupid. I shouldn't even sh have shot, but you get so jacked up and you're in that moment and you just, you just have to laugh those off. It was a great big buck. And you're like, dad, gum it. That, oh, I should have had him. But, oh man, you just have to laugh them off. And I, that's bow hunting. That's, um, that's a tough thing for a bow hunter. That, that situation that you just, just, just described there. I've done that a couple times in my bow hunting career, and it's a shot I would never take. Yep. If I could think about it, if I could rethink it, if I could redo, I would never do that. It's not ethical. It's not a good shot. There's no way I'm going to hit him, but you're right. You come to full draw, pin starts to find that animal, and he starts to move, and you panic and execute the shot, and it's nowhere close. The animal's <laughs> three, four yeah. steps off by the time your arrow gets there, and then you just feel like such an idiot. You're idiot. like, why did I? He was moving. I should have stood <laughs> Like that was no shot to take, but yeah, that's that, you know, that's that, um, that, that buck fever, it's ingrained in our DNA from our ancestors 200,000 years ago of having so much pressure to kill that animal and bring it back to their tribe and live another day. It was survival. It, is, it meant so much, but that is ingrained in our DNA and that panic, that's not something that's unique to you or unique to me. And I've seen my buddies do it too, where, you know, like you get to chew them, chew on them a little bit and they go, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. Right? I, I'm an idiot. I, I never <laughs> right. would take that shot but yeah there's something there that um that uh like is i think that happens to everybody but it's something to learn from and just like man i gotta be better i've gotta be more disciplined that in if i don't shoot who knows maybe that bull runs off and stops another 10 15 yards yep. and gives me a shot that was like that buck that i missed on film I think that, you know, he was 15 yards, started to roll, and I punched that shot off. I missed him. I think if I wouldn't have missed him or sent that arrow in the rocks, I was so close to that buck. I think he would have stopped again at 40 or 50, mm -hmm. given me my good broadside, and I would have nailed him, and it would have been a done deal, and I would have been a hero. Yeah, you know, right. instead, yes, yes. I yep. panicked, and I forced the shot off, and then I spooked the deer and spooked the opportunity. But, yep, yeah, that's we, part of the game. We've all been there. It is part of the game. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, it comes down at the end of the day. You got to be okay with missing. Oh, you do. Yeah, you have to be okay. Like it, it hurts. You don't want to miss, and yep. you're a little embarrassed because you, you know, you have this skill set that you've built up. But yeah, it's like um, missing that buck that I just told you about. I had a couple misses that season. The buck on film, and then I missed a buck in the late season, the one at 44. I was just telling you about. But I went back up to the vantage point, and it's almost like the way you look at it. So just like you were saying, like I just looked at it, it was like, man, I got the close encounter I was after. He was at a different yardage. I was playing the game. I did the best I could with the scenario I was given. Like, sure, if I could replay it, maybe I would have not shot and not let him get over, kept making moves or something. But I, I, I saw an opportunity. I tried to close a deal. But to me... That was worth the price of admission. That was worth yep. driving all the way down to the southern desert 20 hours. Like that adrenaline rush and getting the chance to make plays on that buck. I walked back up to the vantage point. And I told Dan, I said, man, it makes my trip. I got so close to that buck. I had him, you I know, and he just yep. slipped between my fingers. And I, I actually got another play up on the ridge. He spooked up another buck and a doe. 
and then he stole that buck's doe up on the top of this knob up there. So I actually got to go up and play again, and I, I didn't get a chance at him up there. But I told Dan, I said, that makes my trip. I said, you're yep. you're up to bat, you know. And so gave him the next couple stocks, and I just kept believing in the process. And, like, I know I can make a shot. I'm shooting so good. And then, you know, next opportunity on this real nice 30-inch dark horn muley, and I see it, and he's got this huge frame, and he's kind of got a busted tine on the back. And, you know, he's not going to score real good, but he's heavy and wide and tall. He's just impressive. I thought, yeah, I'd be happy to shoot that buck. And I'd given Dan two or three stocks. And I said, yeah, I can go try to make something happen on that buck. And sure enough, he gave me a shot and pinwheeled that thing. Yep, you know, nice. put it right where, it, you know, I couldn't have walked up and put that arrow any better. And that buck maybe made it 10 yards, maybe made it five seconds before he tipped over dead. It felt so good. Yep. You yep. Know, that re- redemption feels good. Oh, absolutely. And probably coming back to that too is especially after you miss or you have a blown stock it's just a numbers game right it is a numbers and, and game, and that's what you have to tell yourself is that like okay we, we got one out of the way we got a blown stock or a miss out of the way it's just a matter of time before it's gonna fall your way mm-hmm. and i think that plays a, a, a big role in keeping that positive attitude mm-hmm. because that plays right along with that if you have a negative attitude you're a negative nancy out there it ain't gonna happen so right it could be the most important thing yeah just a positive attitude it could be brian i yeah it's Mm -hmm. there's definitely something to be said for that and that's just not bow hunting that's any type of hunting Mm -hmm. like if you don't have a positive attitude or if somebody's a negative nancy that you're hunting around might not be the best hunting partner Mm -hmm. yeah and and may not go your way like uh you have to almost be an an optimist and if things aren't working out or you're not getting the desired results it's like, what can I change? You know, it, yep. it's, it's constantly looking to put forth that effort to give yourself a chance of success. So like I've had instances, you know, or say you're not finding animals. Well, well, this isn't a negative to me. Like I just got to go somewhere else where the animals are. I got to find animals. So I just come up with the next game plan. Okay. I got to go work washes and look for tracks and work water and look for tracks. I got to find a population of deer. I'm not into them here. I got to figure this out, figure out the habitat they like, but I, I just keep working to solve the problems instead of working, you know, working on the solution to solve the problems instead of focusing on the problem. And also, if you're not enjoying the process and you're not enjoying yeah. the entire eight, 10 day hunt, even if you're into animals, not into animals, you're not going to be very successful because it takes enjoying this this long time of, of you know, days and weeks uh, of hunting to create this opportunity, but you better enjoy all that stuff that leads up to it because yep. that's the majority of the hunt, really. Yeah, absolutely. The killing is such a small portion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the moment of truth is such a small portion. But, yeah, if you're not enjoying – yeah, I mean, there, it's probably normal to not enjoy some of the process, maybe, but that's where – There's ups and downs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's just – just the way it is and it, ups and it's downs, not but. fun the whole time like yeah. uh, you know it's effort right. and it's a grind but yeah. uh in the end when you get done with a hunt or you a hunt gets over it's all you can think about is being back yeah. there yep yeah. and isn't it it's crazy that for me i gravitate or my thoughts or my memories gravitate to maybe some of the more uncomfortable situations that i've been in and I'm like man i want to go do that again i know it's weird. Yeah, uh, that's the sickness, I think. Yeah, no, that's yeah, got to go to counseling for that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a sickness. That's a sickness. <laughs> well, and I've also found, like, I remember hunting coos deer a couple of years ago, and um, we were in a really good spot, and we were seeing multiple bucks per day, and they were rutting hard, and they, you know, we were seeing five bucks a day. We were getting stocks every day, but we could not get one killed day after day, four or five days at it. And most of the time, it's a numbers game where I'm always thinking about, okay, if I can get a stock every couple days or if I can get a stock a day, I know I can kill. If I can get this many stocks in a hunt, like I try to add it up that way a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Um, But this just wasn't working. So the the mountains we were hunting, they were real big rolling hills with without much contour topography. There was topography. The, the open rolling hills made it to where the distances between cover and topography was a long ways in between. And, and also, they hadn't had any cattle in this area, and so the grass had all grown really tall, and the grass was super crunchy. Mm-hmm. Well, pretty soon, like four or five days, it feels like I'm beating my head against the wall. 
I, we just cannot get it done. Nobody's loosed an arrow. We're making stocks every day. But it's tough to leave because we're into these bucks. But finally, we just decided, you know, we got to get out of here. We got to go find someplace. We just got to change it up. Yep. You know, seeing these good bucks every day, we just can't kill them. In the moment we moved to a different piece of country that had more topography, it was tighter country, so the coolies were like 50 yards apart instead of 200 yards apart. And so we just put ourselves in this different ungulation in this different country. And sure enough, my, my buddy got a shot at a really good buck and ended up missing him. I'm not sure if it was a range thing or what happened. And then I ended up killing a buck in the matter of a couple days after beating our head against the wall for five days straight. Like... Just that that change in problem solving or just coming up with a different way to go about it. And that was everything on that. Hunt. Yep. Man, it's it's amazing talk you saying that. I, I find at least once a season, I find that situation exactly where it's just like no matter what you do, it's just not coming together. And, and that could be a hard part, too, is knowing when to pull out. And, okay, time to switch it up. The animals are here, but – Let's go find some different terrain. And, of course, it's hard if you haven't been somewhere before. It's a new unit, and you don't have that scouting uh, time in or whatever. But you gravitate back to, to – to me, I gravitate back to some of those situations where maybe the terrain – the value is in the terrain is, is what's going to make me successful. Maybe the, the bulls aren't that big there. Maybe it's an Idaho spot, and there's really not big bulls. But the terrain might be money, and I know I'm going to be, you know, getting a shot opportunity – and if I go in somewhere new and it's one of those situations where I just can't get it done because something's goofy, like you said, with the grass, the, the cows haven't been in there and there's just some catalyst that's preventing you from getting it done. You move and bam, I've had it a number of times first morning in some place or the first evening in some place you're tagged out. It's funny how that works. So funny. It is. And you can't really explain it. It's yeah. just a feel thing. It is a feel and thing. And it takes a few days mm -hmm. to be like, frack. Like, it's just not, this isn't right. And, and spots always hunt better when they're fresh, too. Your yeah. first time yeah. in there or your first go at it or your first couple days. So, so yeah, like you say, I'll find a good spot. But then I'm almost married to that spot as I keep hunting it because I keep seeing animals. But the animal activity just keeps going down and down and down. Like the hunting just keeps getting worse and worse every day. And my chances are just getting lower and lower every day. Yeah. Like you say, you know, you, you want to never quit attitude, but you don't. You want to know when to quit an area and when right. to move on. Like that is a big part of hunting is yep. going, you know. I got the best couple days of this place. It's starting to turn off. Like maybe I can go check back in here in four or five days and let it reset. But for now, I got to go find some more animals. I got to go find something new. I'm, I'm not going to get it done here. I just, I need to change things up. And, yep. and it is amazing. Like you said, how sometimes you just make a little change like that. And it's, it's like magic. All yeah. of a sudden you arrow, a, arrow an animal and it's, it's uh, like, it's meant to be. It is. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's like divine intervention. Like mm -hmm. you can't really describe it. And just thinking about a hunt where that happened a few years ago, the elk were just, they're zigging and I was zagging and you know you, you think you know what you're doing and it, which you more or less you probably do you know how to move in the mountains and stuff but maybe you don't have their movements figured out or and it's just it's just not happening mm -hmm. and and yeah you go somewhere else boom mm -hmm. it's funny oh, or you know what I find too is that uh, the elk rut really ebbs and flows and so elk will get really hot and get in the rut. They're breeding cows. They're in estrus. And then it'll kind of take a downturn and they're not breeding cows. Yes. And what I have found is that that's not universal through all the mountains through the whole unit. Like that's just that little elk herd that you're working. You may go down five miles down the yep. range and they're going crazy, bugling like crazy. And where you're at, you know, you see the cows and there's no bulls with them and there's a bull off on his own and it's middle of September and you're thinking, what the heck's going on here? But you go five miles down the range or you cross the valley and go into the other mountain range and all of a sudden you're into the biggest elk party and you end up arrowing a bull. But that knowing when to go look for another elk herd or just knowing when to look for something different, that's so key to hunting. Oh, it is. It is. The timing thing, the timing of it, and a lot of that's out of your control too, but mm -hmm. also being able to know... Yeah, when, okay, it's not going on here, 
or the action just isn't good enough. Odds are probably not in my favor here. Let's go find another elk herd or let's go find another herd. It probably all revolves around a hot cow mm-hmm. on, you know, if, if elk are going to be wound up or not more or less, mm-hmm. but no, that that's a huge part of it. Mm-hmm. It's the timing thing. Mm-hmm. And when I found like, I don't know if you found this and this is a question that I'm posing to you and I'm going to load the question, but I, I find that in some areas when it rains and it snows, the bulls get fired up and rut like crazy. And then I notice sometimes when it rains or it snows, they totally shut off and I'm around elk and they're not bugling. Do you find that when you're elk hunting? Absolutely. Do you? Yeah. It's like affects them. It never affects them the same every time. No, no. And I, I, what I have seen personally, I attribute it to maybe the, the habitat type they're in. If they're at like 10,000 feet and you get like four inches of snow, that's when I found the biggest change of there, I mean, it just completely shuts off. Maybe they migrate down the mountain, they move, it just completely shuts off. And in other situations, if I'm in lower country or hunting the desert, uh, maybe that rain or snow doesn't really change anything. I've tried to build correlations in my mind, and that's where it's probably important to keep notes every year on to what elk are doing and what mountain range. Oh, and yeah. I found that like in mountain ranges, especially in Montana, anywhere, really anywhere, whether you're in the Bighorn mountains here, the elk do something different than they do in the Madison range mm, or the crazies. It, it's, they're all completely different is what I have, have found and weather affects them differently. And the bighorns, I would say are the most extreme. Those elk, I mean, it, it'll be a full on party, like early season, early season's the time to hunt up there above tree line. But as soon as you get weather, as soon as you get snow, I spent 12 days elk hunting in the bighorns a few years ago on that tag that I had. And most of my time was just trying to get back on the elk because they were moving so much because of weather. And ultimately at the end of that hunt, I I killed an okay six point and, you know, mission accomplished. But, you know, those, that's just one thing. It's kind of taken the odds off your side. And so I don't have any interest in hunting the bighorn mountains any anymore because there's just easier places to kill elk is, is that the right way of putting it i don't know but talking to other guys too like that's just how the elk are and the bighorns is they're just like that and they move a ton mm-hmm. and when you're spending over half your hunt just trying to get back on elk because they move so much i mean that's huge that, that's huge that's a big difference from you know probably you could go home being unsuccessful to having a herd maybe like in the desert in this lower country stuff where the weather doesn't move them that doesn't affect them as much and you can get on elk every day i mean your odds just skyrocket the key to killing elk is being into elk consistently yep. and even us that are fairly proficient at hunting six point bulls like we do it every year you know multiple places yep. multiple mountain ranges like still the key for our success is to keep into elk keep finding elk yep. keep hunting elk like the moment you're spending all your time looking for them you're just not in the game and it it's part of the process and it's part of what needs to happen but yep. um I, I think you're spot on i think it's really interesting that you talk about these different elk herds have different tendencies and habits and, and behaviors. They just act different. Like every elk herd is its own identity. And the, the, the way, you know, elk, they adapt to their habitat. And, and what's wild is elk can adapt to habitat down on the desert. Like you're talking up at 10,000 feet, uh, the badlands, the breaks, the, you know, all these different mountain ranges, but these elk, they evolve in these mountain ranges for thousands of years and their young evolves to, to be the most effective and efficient in this living in this habitat. And so you're right. Every elk herd acts just a little bit different, which is, mm-hmm. which is part of the fun of hunting them it, too. Absolutely. And I'm, I've kind of become obsessed with that and I love hunting new areas to learn about how elk move and why they move when they move. And just like my tag this year, um, that I drew here in Wyoming. I never hunted it before. And I've, I'd heard some things uh, migratory wise on elk coming out of the back country and moving down to rut cows that are, you know, running private. Mm-hmm. And so I set up trail cams this year. And because I just wanted to learn like, where are they coming from? Number one, when are they coming? Number two, because from what I heard that zone, it can be a ghost town one day and just completely lit up the next day. And I learned a lot this year about that particular area. And it's different than anywhere I've ever been. 
any other elk herd I've ever been. It was just different. And for whatever reason, you know, nothing on the trail cam, uh, until August 26th, I believe hard horned. They, they, and these elk, these bulls specifically, they were coming out of the back country completely clean. So clean horns, just rubbed, no mud on their body. And I found a wallow in that transition zone that a lot of these bulls, this is the first wallow that they hit on August 26th. And they hit this wallow and they leave all muddy and multi- bull after bull after bull. Wow. And then they just kind of disperse. And so I went up there like three days later, I couldn't find a bull. But they, they're traveling so much and so much of it is timing. And it's difficult because I'm getting, you know, some giant bulls on video, some 360 plus bulls on video. And you're like, man, I, I got to find these suckers, you know, but they're not on public and there's enough private land in the zone that, you know, you may never see them just because you can't access that private. And so like a hunt like that, I'm probably going to gravitate less towards in the future because the movements, it's kind of extreme. They, they move a long ways and it's unpredictable and it's not consistent. The hunting is not consistent. And so that is just a big player against you in, in the odds of the, in the grand scheme of mm-hmm. things. Gosh, that's interesting. Uh, elk hunting does seem like it's all about timing. They're so nomadic yes. that you can walk up the best elk drainage in the whole mountain range and you can walk up there and you can be a week late or a week early and you don't see an elk in there but you show up at the right time and it's an absolute elk party. And then it seems like you can time it year after year after year, but it's not always the same dates or this, it may shift just a little bit. Like say it always, like I always get into these elk in the second week of September. Well, that may shift around a few days, but they yep. seem to show up year after year in these spots. And, and one of the spots I do really good is my home Valley. Like I, I've been hunting elk there for 20 years and I've hunted sheds there. And I just know these elk herds really well. Well, I know, you know, I have some early spots that I can go to and other mountain ranges that I hunt, but I know when I see a snowstorm coming in, I know where all these elk show up at. And when I get a big snowstorm in September, they move into these spots and they rut like crazy and nobody's on to them because I know the day they're going to show up the the whole valley all is all socked in and the, you know, there's, it's snowing. Nobody's hunting because it's snowing. They don't think they can get on them. And when these snowstorms come in, I have like a handful of different spots that I'll hunt. And every year it's some of the best hunting I ever see when these snowstorms come in. So I take note of that. That's yep. timing, but they're only there during a big snowstorm or, you know, later in the season maybe, but it's yep. only during that snowstorm that they show up and it's epic hunting you can go there the rest of the 330 days of the year and you won't see an elk you just see yep. old sign but then when that timing's right that's when the elk hunt is perfect and that's what's special in an elk spot because it, not it's very few spots are predictable year after year like that and like a, a situation like that you probably don't hunt that every year because the conditions aren't right mm-hmm. every year or you might have tagged out somewhere else but having those spots like that, that, you know, and it's just a time thing from doing it year after year after year and witnessing that and spending the time finding that and understanding the elk behavior. That's special, especially on public land. And that's why it's, I mean, it's, it's so rare to find a consist, consistent spot year after year. Cause like you said, it's, it's not on the same date every year. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know what you experienced this year, but it was hot and dry this summer. Mm-hmm. And it was hot and dry into September. The rut was late. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we didn't have bulls bugling the first 10 days, really, in in some of the areas. But up way up high, I I did find some action. But, like, up in the breaks where I was hunting with my brother, I mean, there was nothing going on until, like, the 10th of September. And everybody was just kind of scratching their head, like, where are the elk? They're usually here this time of year. But every year is so different and just because you draw a you know a limited entry tag or a, a good tag doesn't mean it's going to be easy Mm-mm. because it's just elk are so dynamic and the, there's so many factors with the weather and the year before and how they uh how the green up was in the spring on where they're going to be and how they transition and where they migrate to it's it's amazing i'm just completely fascinated by elk and their movements and mule deer are the same way right but it seems like elk they can be so nomadic and so difficult to figure out. 
And so it is special when you have one of those spots that you can go to when the conditions are right mm-hmm. year after year. Mm-hmm. Protect those spots. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're spot yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, and and you're right. Like as I hear you saying that about the timing and things, like I do have some drainages that are always good around the second week, you know, give or take. But but I also have like uh, mountain ranges or or places where I hunt elk where the conditions of that year totally dictates where the elk are. And so where I killed my bull this year, you know, I don't know, you know, I always come up with theories of what it is, but I'm not so sure of what it is. It was such a dry summer that I think a lot of the food, the feed burned off in the areas that I like to hunt. And so therefore the elk weren't in there, or maybe it was COVID and the hunting pressure. And there was guys that dove in there early and they spooked them out of there, spooked them to different places or, or moved them along their path. And, um, oh, I, I heard all kinds of theories. I heard theories that the grasshoppers were bad and they ate the grass and then the elk. <laughs> I mean, it got yeah. a little weird, but, uh, but, but it is conditional and you can, you can, you notice it when it like, like this place that I killed my bull this year, it hunts different every single year is like a different year in this place. And even though I have these spots that the elk prefer or that the elk like, or they rut in or move through, you know, it's just elky country. I went in this year and I struck out spot after spot after spot after spot that usually there's some elk in there. They just weren't in there this year. I don't know what it was, yep. but again, it just, it pushed me to go look for some spots that I had e-scouted that were totally different than spots I had hunted and just started bombing into these drainages and hunting fresh and trying to figure out, okay, where are these elk, you know, and finally started to see a few and okay, where are these ones moving to after they're pressured in here? Okay. I'm going to walk in here and then I stumble upon a great big bull, you know? So yep. like, that's just the way it happens, but you're right. Some of these places or a lot of these places, it's different every year, just dependent on the conditions. Yep. And that's what makes it tough. Yeah. Going back, circling back around the, the biggest, well, one of the biggest keys to success elk hunting is being on elk every day. Oh, that's it. Yeah, it really is. And that, that's the hardest part. I feel Mm -hmm. like, especially the public land game, being on elk every day is so difficult and you may not really think of it. I mean, you're just going out elk hunting, you're just hunting elk, but it's, it's an odds game. It's a numbers game. If you can be on elk every day, eventually it's going to fall your direction. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's my goal too. Just trying to stay in them. Yep. Yep. So that's you, you had do. a good elk hunt this year. Yeah. Yep. Home, home state. Yep. Home state only had one tag this year, which kind of was a bummer. I missed out on Idaho selling out so quick and my brother drew Montana. And so I wanted to allocate time with him. That's right. And you so, hunted with your brother. Gosh, yep. you guys killed yep. a slammer. Your brother yeah. did. Yeah. What a cool hunt, man. It's going to make such yep. a good video. It was, it was incredible. And I, I wanted to make sure that I could do everything in my power to get him a giant bull. And you know, we spent the time and it was a, a weird year, but it happened. It happened. And the look on his face and it, I should just tell you the quick story because Dude, I want to hear it. It's once again, you, th- you think you've seen every scenario, but you haven't, you haven't, especially when it comes down to a kill shot, but this bull And this is where I I really, this year I was like, I want to understand elk behavior more vocally. I I know, and especially you, always go back to spot and stalk. It's an effective technique in open country. I mean, it's just effective. But I was like, I want to call some bulls in. Or or you just, you're more aware. I wanted to be more aware of the behavior of a bull and look for that certain behavior that you know is callable, that he is going to come in and and hopefully you get lucky and find a bull like that. Anyway, so we hunted 10 days and it was just tough. It was tough up there. It's hot, dry. We weren't finding the bulls and just being in the zone, we we're trying new areas and bumping around until we found a herd. And it was September 11th. And this was kind of like the first rut activity we saw. And we found a cow herd and there were several small bulls around, but it was still pre rut. And, and so, we, we didn't focus on that herd, even though there were several nice, decent bulls in there, but you know that the big bulls are going to be around. And so don't be distracted by the, the big herd. That's kind of what our theme was for that day. And my brother caught a big bull slip down the ridge behind us out in the wide open. And he took off over this ridge and I didn't see it because I was on the other side of the hill glassing. And he's like, yeah, it was a big bull. It had to have been at least 330. And I was like, well, let's go find him. 
And so we, we dogged this bull and he, my brother said he did bugle as he was going down. So we have a solo bull pre rut, a big bull and he's bugling that bull calling cows bugled just really intense and, and just really loud, intense bugle that bull searching. Right. But he, he hasn't found the herd yet. And so, okay, this is our target. And it's like my bull I killed uh, two years ago in the back country. Same thing, big old bull kind of in the periphery same situation. So this bull, you know, across some wide open country and he was kind of pointing in the direction of this timber patch on this North face. So we were just, we ran for like a mile, not didn't run, but we hiked our butts off to try and stay with him because he was traveling. And it was getting daylight. We come to this big, uh, Doug fur North face and I'm like, yeah, he's gotta be in there. So I actually, my brother, he let out just a nice, not too intense bull calling cows bugle. And that bull fired right back. So, okay, intensity, this bull hit that bugle right back and he stepped out in the open and we look at him like, okay, don't look directly at the antlers on that sucker. We just got to kill him. That's what we know. It's a big bull. And I think over the court, we were 300 yards from him and we could see him. He could see us, but we didn't call when he was in the open because they pinpoint you. They're smart. They'll pinpoint you. So we just watched him and he bugled three or four more times because he's searching. He just, he wants that company. He's searching for those cows. And I was like, Justin, we're going to get in on this thing and we're going to call him in. And so we slip down, we go down over, um, under the fence, cross the Creek. And by that time that bull had just worked back into the timber and he was rubbing. And so we could hear him. He's only 300 yards away. He's back in the timber. So we have that little window to move cause he's undercover. So we slip down, we cross that Creek and as we're going up the other side, we have this old growth Doug fur and, and we can hear him rubbing. And I, I don't think we could have stalked in there really. I, th I really believe this was our play on, on this calling situation. And as we moved up the hill, you know, you're checking the wind, you're looking at your terrain and you're like, okay, how can I call and use this terrain to my advantage? So I'm going to make that bull come to at least right here where he can see down over the hill and see that there's no elk down there because they will if you can trick them into believing that there's elk and you have some sort of natural barrier they're going to come they're elk they're a vocal animal right and so we slip in there and and uh I'm like I told my brother I'm like give him a couple lost calf calls and he's like okay and he was he's like so amped up and he's just like what do I do and so like I'm just like telling him what to do along the way because he's just so wound up and so Anyway, a couple lost calf calls and that bugle just, that bull fires right back. Just a ripper. I was like, yeah, he's coming. And we probably called too much, but a, a couple more calling sequences. Uh, he, and he kind of finished up rubbing. And I was like, give him like a challenge bugle, but nothing, nothing too intimidating. You don't want to scare him off. And I mean, he's a big ass bull, so we probably weren't going to anyway. Gives him a little challenge bugle. And that was a flip of the switch. All of a sudden he's done rubbing and he's 75 yards anyway. And here he comes. I mean, you can hear him coming. He beagles again. The beagles closer. And, you know, during this time, so we're set up right on the crest of this ridge, and we're trying to direct our calls down below in the creek, knowing that bull is going to want to come at least to that ridge where we're on to see down there. But we called a little too much, so he came out at 40 yards, and he's just looking right at us. But we're, like, tucked in in the shade. We got a big dug fur. I'm right behind my brother. He's got his bow up. I'm filming in between his head and the bow, just like in this window. And this bull just rips off a bugle, snot flying, drooling. And I was like, dude, this thing. And he's like getting ready to shoot. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Don't shoot, don't shoot. He's 40 yards, but he's frontal still. And we've, I, I, I don't think I've ever taken like a real frontal shot, like a true frontal. Like I've been too scared to. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't either. But my rule of thumb is a lot of guys do. You see it all the time, but my rule of thumb is if it's 15 yards or closer, I'll, I'll take a frontal. That's my, that's my rule too. Yeah. Super close. Yeah. Because be the close. spot you got to hit is about the size of a grapefruit. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Small, uh, you know, small room for air. So this bull, he kind of, he knew where the calling was coming from, but he still couldn't see down over that hill. So he just starts walking down the trail right to us. So my brother had his single pin slider, which he converted to for the first time this year. I talked him into it, but he had it set for 40 and I wasn't on him enough. I, I should have told him just to leave it at 30, just leave it there. Um, but it just didn't happen. Anyway, this bull's walking down the trail and I have never seen this before, but that bull gets to 30. He gets to 25. He gets to 20. And my brother draws his bow 
with almost no motion. He draws his bow, and right when he starts drawing with that motion, that bull just looked down the hill right at that split second in time, and so the bull didn't see my brother draw at 15 yards. So, so what he did see, my brother draws the bow. All of a sudden, my window to film is gone because I don't have that bow and head space anymore <laughs> so he draws he's at full draw this I, I can hear this bull breathing and i just go zoom, and i just kind of lean out from my brother to the side and that's what the bull saw at that point so this bull's at 15 yards and he's like looking and, and we're hidden i mean we're set up and my brother's like should i shoot i'm like yes <laughs> <laughs> like yes no shit you shoot shoot <laughs> he's 15 yards so he shoots and he was pretty wound up and he, and he hits him high in the neck. And so we, we kind of talked about this and I was like, dude, you're, you're going to get roasted on this, like with comments. Cause it's, it doesn't look like a good hit. It's not a good hit. It's a meat hit. So he, he hits him in the neck and we're like, frick, that's a meat hit. That bull's gone. Ah, he was a giant bull giant. And you're, so you're just sick to your stomach. And you know, it, you know, what happened? You know, that's the first thing you're like, you, you want to ask him. And he knew his, his sight was set at 40 and this bull's at 15 yards, but he, he never practiced at 15 yards with his sight set at 30 or 40. So you're guessing on how low to hold. You got right? no reference of what yeah. that, tw- that 25 yards is. You know, ballpark maybe, but yeah, yeah. And it, you would know you spent a lot yeah. of time with that sight. Yeah. With that sight and your first year, you, you might not know as exactly. much. Right. Yep. And, and he, his, his trajectories a lot worse for that situation because he's a 27 inch draw. He's got a really heavy arrow. So he has a, a little more trajectory. So when your sight's set at 40 and that bull's at 15, I mean, it might be 20 inches. Yep. And so he told me he draws back frontal and then he puts his pin on the bottom of his brisket, like right down on the bottom, but it's, it's hard. And it, it, I don't care how much experience you have. If you're, if you're holding that much off of where you want to impact at that distance, it's very tough to wrap your brain around that because ideally he should have held off the animal, you mm-hmm. know, off the brisket, like that low, like 20 inches low. It's so tough but to aim that low yeah, and let your pin it, settle. Yeah. You just can't. You can't. No, you can't. And so, and he did the best he could and, and he held low. And so anyway, that's why it went high and it was a little bit to the right. And, you know, at first, first thought we're like, yeah, that thing's gone. And so I'm like, well, let's go look for blood. It's the least we can do, you know? And so we just gave it like 15 minutes and we walked up there and we saw where that bull was standing and there's no blood, of course. And we're like, oh, he ran out this way. He ran back down the trail and then cut up the hill. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, there's a drop of blood right there. And we kept walking and there's more and more blood and like a little more than all of a sudden it was just like pouring a water bottle out. And so this bull was just running through the brush basically but it was just like you're dumping a water bottle out you know where we're going with this one and then he stopped and there's a pool of blood i'm like dude i i think you got the jugular and i i just don't see how this isn't a jugular hit with this amount of blood and it wasn't like i think he nicked the jugular is what happened because the bull went like 300 yards and died but it was like a really easy blood trail to follow and it's it was kind of a bittersweet moment yep. because that's not how he wanted it to go down. No, that's not how anybody wants it to go down. And then, you know, you're sec- second guessing, you know, frontal shots now. Right. You're like, Oh, that was a bad shot. And, and he's like, he's like, I just don't deserve this bull. That's what he tells me. So it's almost like remorse that he was, he actually, he has this bull laying at his feet and it's his bull. And he's like, I, I didn't deserve this bull. And I was like, dude, that's bow hunting. <laughs> That's what you got to chalk it up to. Frontal shots are hard. It's low odds. And sometimes things happen that are out of your control and you just got to take them. Mm-hmm. You got to, you got to take what comes your, your way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, did you get lucky and you hit this bull in the jugular and you made a really clean kill, mm-hmm. but you know, you have a kill zone, the size of, yeah, maybe your index finger, a jugular vein on an elk. And that's what he hit. And so it was, it was a, it was a somber melancholy moment maybe Mm -hmm. when we got up to this bull there was no like hooping and hollering Mm -hmm. or like you know congrats on a perfect execution on a super giant bull there wasn't really none of that it was just like we were like pretty calm and you know took some time just to like analyze everything and let it sink in a little bit and you know you have your high fives and stuff but at the end of the day you just kind of shake your head and be like man that's bow hunting Mm -hmm. what do you do 
And you have all it. you can do, you got to take the, the good luck with the bad luck. Yeah. Because a lot of times that animal moves and you don't hit him right. And it wasn't your fault. You executed a good shot. He ducked the string or he started moving or he, you know, there's so many variables that can end yep. up in a bad shot that you had no control over. So the same way you have to take that in stride, you have to take a, uh, something that ends up good like that. Absolutely. But, you know, it just, it just shows what a good guy you are and what a good guy he is, you know, for Justin, for, to, to not feel good about that, just go, man, I just don't deserve – I didn't execute my shot. I didn't – and I've been in that situation yeah. too, yep. and it is. Like you're happy you got the bullet, and you're happy you made a quick, clean kill, but you're just not so happy with the shot and the way it went down. And, it, man, it's just like those moments, they just happen so quick, and it – it's so many it's a hundred quick decisions that you have to make and they all have to be right. Yep. And if you if you just lose focus for one second or you just have something that goes wrong, it can end up but all all's you know, all's well that ends well yep. and in a you, you better smile as a bow hunter when you do get lucky and Absolutely. it works out like that. So I'm sure he didn't feel real good at, in the moment, but as it started to sink in, he was probably happier and happier with the outcome of things and just, just knows he has to be better on the next one. But that's yep. all just experience. And yep. and if, you, if you've never made a mistake or you've never missed, you, you're either lying or you haven't bow hunted exactly. long enough, just like you said exactly. at the beginning of the podcast. Absolutely. But, man, how thrilling. Oh, my gosh. Oh, on a big, dark, Just, heavy bull. It was a dream bull you guys killed. It was. And then to call him yeah. in is, yeah. like, the most intense way to kill a big bull like that. Yep. And you're you're right. Like, um, man, you're, you're elk hunting. You, you're just you're, – you're on a – you're on a high level of elk hunting right now when you can recognize those situations and capitalize on them. I mean, elk hunting, you know, we talk about the key to success is always being into elk, always chasing elk, but it's also like capitalizing on opportunities, finding a bull and making those moves to give yourself a chance to lose an arrow. And you guys found that bull and you hadn't had a lot of success in 10 days, but you found a good bull and then you tailed him, followed him, and then you theorized and you came up with where he's going and what he's doing. He doesn't have cows, but he's bugling. And and your approach to that to that elk and to that hunt with your brother, it, it was spot on perfect. Like you yep. nailed it on that bull, yep. you know. Uh, and you guys did so many things right on that hunt. Um yeah, man, congratulations. No, what an awesome bull to your brother. It, it was special. It was. And, and your brother's a heck of a good bow hunter, too. He is. He, he killed is. another buck. That guy is yep. good at executing shots. He is. I, I know, um, you know, I know he wanted to execute a perfect shot on that bull, and it, you know, it, it wasn't it was just circumstance. Yep. It, it wasn't losing his mind. It wasn't freaking out. Like it, you know, it just like, it didn't all add up with the mover site and the aim and low and how, and, and just like I talked about missing that buck at 44, like it yep. doesn't happen. Perfect. You finally get a bull to 15 yards, but here's the deal. You don't get any range on him, and you don't get to move your sight. Exactly. And you got to try to draw when he's looking right at you and try to execute a shot. It's not, perfect you're just trying to do the best you can do you know with the skill set you have yep. and that's all you can ask for yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and and that's at the end of the day we, after it's over and you kind of have a laugh about it you yeah, know, yeah because you're just like God, you, you couldn't have planned that out yeah like, it's just so crazy <laughs> how it happened and you know you're like out of all bulls for you to get shit house lucky <laughs> is the, on a 380 bull that i mean you killed and you know inside he's like well i don't deserve it but it's like well you, you do because mm -hmm. you were out here trying and mm -hmm. there's a it's bow hunting a lot of dead control. it was bulls, your bow and yeah, arrow <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah no that's exactly right huh but no that's for you guys. that's a fun part and i guess the disclaimer too is and especially like why we spot and stock elk hunt is elk are smart and you can tell a big difference from an area that has relatively low hunting pressure compared to like a general area that has high hunting pressure bulls just don't come into the call just slick as you please every time mm -hmm. and so elk act differently based on how much pressure or how many predators are around as well mm -hmm. and so in this area it's a lower pressure and so yeah you still look at you know the behavior and the demeanor of that elk and capitalize on his behavior but it's just a little easier in this area because they just don't get called at mm -hmm. as much. Yep. And so that's just a little disclaimer I want to put out is yep. that it's, it's not really that easy, but it can be. 
oh, in, in some areas. Be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even as it comes back, circles back around to the timing thing too. In general areas, if you catch a bull on the right day and he's hot and fired up, heck yeah, you can call heck him in. Heck yeah. Yep. Call him right in. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times too, uh, you better spot stock. That might be your only option because they're not rutting or they're not what doing what they're supposed to do or you're – you're not in a good situation to make a call. That's the other thing too, is that if you find a super giant bull and you don't have the cover or you don't have the situation, it's not the situation that you know you can call him in. You better rely on your spot and stock skills. Mm-hmm. And I enjoy it both. I do too. And, and largely I enjoy learning as much as possible and getting in situations like that and then applying maybe what I know or more more largely applying my theories of what I think they might do, or I think might work and then applying it. And mm-hmm. you know, it works out and that that's what's, that's what the hunt's all about. To it me. is what the hunt's yeah. all about. Yeah. The using our brain, trying to theorize, trying yep. to come up with the outsmarting, solution. Outsmarting yeah. your prey. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's a big reason why I hunt mm-hmm. is the challenge of outsmarting your prey. And it's, it's not all about the, you know, the inches, but, killing a bigger and bigger bull every year. That, that's my goal. Why wouldn't it be? Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to kill a bigger bull and, and you want to one up yourself. Mm-hmm. It's a great challenge to yourself. That's, that's why I love it. Mm-hmm. Everybody's a little bit different. So, so how about you? I mean, what's, what's your, maybe there's a lot of reasons why to bow hunt, but can, you can relate to what I'm saying, right? Absolutely. Like you always, you're going to be happy with a bull because it's, it's not really all about the inches, but you're, you're going to try to kill the biggest bull in there if you can do it. <laughs> right. That's what excites me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like the challenge of the whole deal. Yeah. And I just love, I love having the opportunity of bull like that. It's special, Yep. you know, and to is. have the chance to make the right moves on a bull like that um, on public ground. That's a special deal. It is. And, and I'm with you. I, you know, I do more of the spot and stock for sure. And I know a lot of our conversations have been based around that, but you know, it, it's good to have all those tools in, in your toolbox. And, you know, I know, uh, like having my Hawaii buddies come out, you know, we've done more and more calling setups and we've yep. called in bowls and, um, you know, got interaction, interaction out of bowls. And, you know, it, it, it's been fun because it's been, you know, probably 15 years since I've really gone out and tried to call the bulls hard and call them in. Yep. And, um, yeah, they do respond. I mean, you know, definitely lower pressure elk coming out of wilderness spots are going to respond better to calls yes. than high pressure elk. But even in some of these high pressure units where the elk haven't been called to right uh, yet, or just like you said, you catch the timing right and it's yep. a rut fest down in there, or you catch a bull that's looking for cows and sure you can call that bull in, you yep. know? So yep. I like to rely upon the spot and stalker. That's my uh, preferred tactic, yep. but yep. I, I think it's good to use all those. And, and sometimes I'm beating my head against the wall spotting and stalking too. You, you, I'm trying yes. to stalk herds of elk and bulls and I'm spooking elk and it isn't working out where if I just went about it calling, I, I may have been more successful than my spot and stock tactics right. too. So it's like six to one, half Absolutely. dozen to another. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, that's the fun part yeah. It's just learning. Cause that's all it is, is, is getting, trying to get better and better at learning elk behavior and elk movement. And that's mm-hmm. what it plays off of. And if you can choose the right path to go on, whether it's to stalk that bull or to try to call him in, mm-hmm. it's just one f- more thing that you're doing right. That's going to increase the odds to fall in your favor in the end. Mm-hmm. I love it. Oh, I love it, man. Isn't it fun? Uh, I mean, oh, dude, oh, you're so, so fun. fun to get on the podcast. Like, I know I don't even have to have a plan with you. I just um, hit record and start talking, and I know it's going to be an engaging conversation for me because we uh, we think so much alike and yep. enjoy the same thing. So, man, I just yep. really appreciate you. Congrats so much on your season. I can't wait to see yours and Justin's hunt come up. Makes, I can't good, wait yeah. to see. We didn't even talk about your six it point bow you yeah. arrowed. Yep. I can't wait to see that episode. But, uh, yep. man, you're a really good bow hunter, and I'd love having you on the podcast. No, absolutely. Like and like you said, this is my favorite podcast to be on because I. I I see a lot of myself and you like we're, I mean, we're cut from the same cloth. We <laughs> yep, are. We and are. so, yeah, it's just so fun. Thanks yeah. for having me on. I, yep. I enjoy it. My pleasure, man. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Again, just always love sitting down with Dan. That guy, uh, he, he lives, eats, sleeps, and breathes bow hunting, uh, the same as I do. And so to get insight from a guy that has so much experience and and so much experience being consistently successful just year after year. Uh, he's just a great elk hunter, great deer hunter, antelope. Uh, he loves Hawaii like I do. He loves to travel. Like I say, he's he's my bow hunting twin in there at Eastman's. And so 
uh, we get together and there may be 20 guys in the room and you can, uh, Dan and I always seem to, to, to be chatting about bow hunting in some off corner or something, you know, we just, we both love it so much. And it, it's, it's such a great endeavor. Like I just love backcountry bow hunting and I, I love, constantly learning and improving and getting better i love like putting my all into to hunting season and and now i've just structured my life in a way where i get a lot of time to do what i love to do and um man i mean this this off season just brings it to the forefront of my mind i kind of get i won't say cabin fever like i keep myself busy and i'm into my training and my research right now and bow hunting is 365 but man, there is nothing funner than like being in a hunting season or coming up on fall, coming up on those August early season mule deer hunts, September early season mule deer, September elk, uh, you know, usually have an antelope tag, you know, hopefully I draw uh, one of these tags, like I'd love an opportunity at a sheep somewhere, desert or Rocky Mountain bighorn and and, and also looking to travel, looking to make it back to Hawaii. And I, I love it up in Alaska, all the different species they have up there. Um, had such a riot in New Zealand. I got to make it back to New Zealand and explore that place more as soon as we open up the borders. But, man, I just love backcountry bow hunting. I love working at it. And I love having these in-depth conversations. And and um, Dan's just the the perfect candidate for the perfect guest. I just love having him on the podcast. So I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, I also want to thank Sitka. Uh, Sitka has been a part of this podcast for a minute now or for a while, and and um, man, I, I'm just so happy to to have them on board and to represent Sitka and and to wear it on on all my hunts. I just feel so fortunate to to be able to use the the best technical mountaineering gear on the planet. I mean, their systems and their layering systems, they just feel like they were built for me. And they've constantly evolved and improved, uh, you know, these different lines. And uh, I see this year they've got a new lightweight uh, rain jacket, rain pant. I, I should have the the notes of what it is. I'll make sure to drop it on the next podcast. But yeah, they've got... Um, might be the Thunderhead series. I'm just guessing at this point, but I just saw that it came out and I looked at the weights and the pants are like 10 ounces and then the jacket's like 12 ounces. And um, yeah, that's that's what Sick is doing. It's constantly looking at their lines and how they can improve them and how they can make them lighter. And man, when you're a backpack hunter or, or any hunter, a day hunter, overnight hunter, you know, whatever the case is, I mean, to cut that, that, that rain gear in half because I always have my rain gear with me uh, to cut the the weight in half just really helps me out like um, man that's a whole nother day of food for me so uh, just so impressed by them uh, so impressed by their gear so uh, make sure to give them some love and check them out if you're in the market for any new gear and um, man just recording some some really good podcasts and excited to release those to you guys. Uh, got got bear hunting up on the horizon. You know that's that's coming up in the next month or so. That's going to open up. Super psyched to go chase those things around with my bow. Uh, again, it's just a uh, it's dangerous game with a bow and arrow. Uh, springtime only have one tag in my pocket. I just love chasing you know, big black bears or big mature boars. And I actually just laid down a really good podcast last night that I'm psyched to release to you guys uh, before bear season. So I'm going to try to get a couple episodes in the works for bear season. And then I just, um, man, I, I really appreciate the support. I hear from you guys that you guys like the solo episodes. So I try to do one of those a month and, um, I'll continue with that. Uh, I need to get a new one out and, um, yeah, just continue producing those things, you know, of what I'm working on and what's helping me improve the things I'm thinking about because I think it's relevant to your guys's backcountry hunting as well. And, you know, with the, you know, there's, um, you know, there's public pressure out there and with um, public hunting pressure, you know, it's just a, about constantly evolving and putting in the effort because there's still like great hunting to be had out there. I'm just so impressed and constantly finding new spots and new locations. It's all about building that hunting skill set and then being able to go on these different hunts in these different places and have a good chance of success. Um, so I absolutely love it. Yeah, if you can't tell, I'm already so ramped up for 2021 and uh, giving it my absolute all. So um, I'm sure you guys are getting excited too. I appreciate all the support on the podcast. And um, yeah, with that, I'll check in with you guys next week.